may have gathered a, a slight hint of an accent. I'm Scottish, I'm from Glasgow, and I know that it's an accent that many people find difficult to understand, so I will try to speak slowly for the benefit of the English people in the room today. There was the old story about the Scot, me, who left Scotland and went to England, and the average IQ of both countries rose at the same time. Anyway, let me get on to the subject in hand. Uh, my background is technology. I'm not a scientist, but I've worked uh, in the, the technology industry. I spent four years at Xerox. I worked for IBM for about 10 years. I worked for Lucent, Dell. I ran T-Mobile in the UK, and then latterly my, my last full-time job was chief exec of Amazon in the UK for about five and a half years. Um, so now I, I mainly spend my time working with e-commerce companies and, uh, and businesses. Um, I think there's a, there's, let me get the clicker. My view in how we got here is that there are, there are basically two laws of theories that uh, influence this. First one is Moore's law, and the second is Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, and I've lived through Moore's law. As you, some of you may recall, Gordon Moore was the, uh, he used to work for, for Fairchild, big semiconductor company. He helped found Intel. And in 1965, he observed that the power of the microprocessor was doubling every 18 months. Um, and this has really defined where technology has come to since then. And uh, when I was at IBM, our competition was called the Bunch. Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Control Data, Honeywell. None of them exist today. They were all mainframe competitors. And then the mid-range business came along and you get different people like Data General, Tandem, Compaq, and they've all disappeared as well. In the PC business, uh, most of the people there have, have disappeared as well. So Ashton Tate, Netscape. So it's been, uh, Moore's Law has been phenomenal for customers, for consumers, but it's been brutal for companies that didn't keep up. When I worked for IBM, I used to sell big mainframes about the size of this stage, and a storage device would be certainly this, this, this wide, this high. The first storage device I sold back in uh, about 1982 the IBM 3370, at half a gigabyte of storage, half a gig of storage, and it cost $100,000. I can now get you something 50 times that storage that you can get in the size of a chip on that thumbnail there, and you can buy that on Amazon today for about $15. So that's what Moore's Law has done, this incredible miniaturization, this incredible increase in power, uh, and this incredible reduction in price. Uh, and I mean, they look back after uh, the, at the year 2000, uh, Moore's projection was correct, and as they roll forward, it's going to keep going. So Moore's law will continue, and if you're in any industry that uses technology, which is almost every industry, uh, you need to be aware of its consequences. The second law, or theory, is Darwin's theory of evolution, first expressed in his Origin of the Species in 1859. Darwin shows us it's not the fastest, and it's not the strongest of the species that survive. It's the most adaptable. And so a business out there today and its people need to be adaptable, they need to understand change, they need to be open to it, and they need to look out for it. Uh, and if you want uh, a lesson than that one, just look at MySpace, the first social network. It was going to take over the planet, and now it's some obscure music site owned by uh, Rupert Murdoch. How about BlackBerry on its, on its knees? How about Nokia? When I ran T-Mobile 12 years ago, Nokia was the king of not just the mobile phone industry, but of all tech and now it's a, it's a byproduct. So Moore's Law gave us technology, but the coming changes that you're going to see in retail and in many other industries are not about technology. They're about behavior and they're about usage because the technology is already here. Smartphones aren't going to get any smaller. The device that you've got in your hand or in your pocket today is the form factor that we'll have in, in five and in 10 years time. Our fingers aren't getting any smaller, our eyes aren't going to get any sharper, so the device that you see today is what it's going to be. It'll be better battery life, it'll have more power, but what, what you see is what you get now. So let's kind of develop that and, and, and just look at what's happened elsewhere. Uh, I talked about Nokia, and, I, and I talk, let's look at Apple as well. So the, the, the purple line at the top here, this is, the, uh, this is Nokia's market cap. The, the blue one is, is Apple. Ignore the green one because it's, uh, it, it's Blackberry. But this basically shows you that Nokia peaked in the year 2000 with a market cap of over 200 billion, 30 times the value of the Apple company at that time. That 220 billion had fallen to 8 billion by July 2012. And at that point, Apple was worth 75 times Nokia. 
So that complete crossover because one company saw where the smartphone was going and one company didn't. And that financial transformation is happening all over the place today. So I've got three messages for you today. First message, e-commerce is growing and it's here to stay. I talked about the conditions created by Moore's Law, we've talked about Darwin, um, but much if not all of the growth in retail today is coming from e-commerce. And even traditional retailers growth is coming from their websites. And it's double digit growth for as far ahead as I or anyone can project. The drivers of that, selection and range, great pricing because it is always cheaper on the internet and great availability including a lot of delivery options. And of course it's underpinned by the technology of the smartphone. The e-commerce model is advantaged. You don't have a portfolio of 500 or 1,000 stores with rent and city tax and property tax. You don't have little inventory pools in each one of these stores. You don't have attrition in the store of your staff at about 50%. And you'll hear a lot today about omnichannel. I think it's important, but it's a mitigation strategy. If you're a pure play e-commerce company like mine are, you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't get to omnichannel. And I think it will retain some customers, but there's no cost advantage to the retailer. There is, in fact, a cost burden. Message number two, know your customer. And here's the importance of mobile and social. And this is an area of big difference between the e-commerce players and the bricks and mortars players. Online players know the customers. They know what they like and they know how to engage them. All that many high street stores know, all they, all they have from the customer is the credit card slip that they've just signed. And in the online market, in the online, amongst the online players, decisions and actions are all data driven. In Wiggle, the online cycling and apparel business that I chair, we know that somebody who buys a bike from us is more likely to return than someone who bought apparel or accessories. And they spend almost twice as much on those return visits. So perhaps as we think about our digital marketing spend, we may think that keywords relating to bikes themselves rather than accessories will have a better value, a better return on investment for us. And then the other thing people talk about is big data. Can you have too much data? On ASOS, we've got 80,000 SKUs. It sounds great, but that can be actually overwhelming to a customer. If you want a pair of super skinny black jeans, then us serving up 2,000 options on a mobile phone is not particularly helpful. And here's for personalization and discoverability come in. Based on your browsing history, based on what you've added to baskets, based on your purchasing history, we can then perform about 5 billion calculations in this area every day. And in about 200 milliseconds, that's about half the time it takes to blink an eye, we can reduce it to the most relevant 20 or 30 items for you. And then we can react to that instantaneously, because if you like it, or if you see an opt from me, we will quickly rerun it and present you with a slightly different selection. So a huge selection is a very important starting point, but you then need to be able to curate that for the customer and serve up something that's relevant. So personalization is one of the key issues that we're all working on. Now take Amazon, my old company. Everyone thinks Amazon is the master of personalization. And isn't it quite spooky? The emails that we get from them are very often things that we think about looking at, or they're very relevant. People who bought this also bought that. But actually, just stop and think about what you've told Amazon about yourself. It's got your email address, it's got your credit card number, and it's got a couple of preferred delivery addresses, and it's got your buying history. But Amazon doesn't know if you're black or white, male or female, if you're 22 or 46. Amazon has never asked you that, will never want to ask you that. It's not, it's not a particularly inclusive, inclusive company, intrusive company. But what it does do is it, it actually has phenomenal algorithms and 18 years of purchasing history, and that's what it uses. So my point is that personalization or relevance does not need to be intrusive. Uh, and it's not a right or a wrong approach. There are different ways of this. So let me just now talk about uh, you know, where mobile has come from and where it's going. Uh, this here just shows you uh, um, uh, ASOS traffic over the past three years. And uh, the blue line is the share of our traffic coming from the browser, from the PC. The red line is the share of traffic coming from mobile. I think we all know how this movie ends. Those lines continue. Uh, and it tells you a couple of things. It tells you that mobile uh, is, is dominant and will continue to be so. It tells you that tablets for shopping 
are fairly relevant. They, they take about 10% and that's it. For me, e-commerce in the future is all about mobile and smartphones. 50% of the global internet traffic is now via mobile devices. Uh, and we spend much more of our time mobile browsing than PC browsing. In ASOS, that number is now 60% of traffic is from a mobile device. And where traffic goes, revenue follows. Our mobile apps had about 9 million downloads. We're downloading about 150,000 a week. And the speed of uptake of mobile is entirely because of the smartphone. We shipped uh, uh, globally about 1.4 billion smartphones uh, last year. The planet will take another 1.5 billion this year. If you allow for some churn or some loss, that's an install base of 2.5 billion already. So there is no going back. And the penetration rate is over 70% in most of the, the developed markets. And remember, the first iPhone wasn't launched until 2007. So the smartphone has been around for less than 10 years. And it's difficult to overstate the impact that it's having on lots of industries, especially retail. And even Google, mobile can cut them out. It looks um, like search may have hit its prime. There's a, a consulting company called Level 2 Inc., which looks at the, the, the retail market in the US. They've got, lot, they've got some great videos on YouTube. Go looking for them. Uh, they say that 6% uh, fewer people this year say they use search engines to discover brands, products, and services. It's all about social networks and Amazon. Uh, based on data they did in the US, 39% of customers uh, looking for products start the search on Amazon versus 11% in Google. And that affects Google, which derives about 90% of its revenue from search. Five years ago, we all started our internet browsing journey with that Google page, with that Google search bar. That's not what we do today. We live our life in a mobile, we live our life in apps, and a large part of the time, we're bypassing Google. A couple of years ago, the data that I saw, Cisco produced a lot of great data in this space, uh, showed that the smartphone was about 18% of the handsets out there, but responsible for 92% of the data usage. So the, sm the smartphone generates 50 times the traffic that one of those old-fashioned clunky candy bar phones did. Can you imagine with an old-fashioned Nokia phone trying to enter a 16-digit credit card and a three-digit security card? You just wouldn't bother. So make things easier and more convenient, and more people will use them. Um, and if you look at how mobile changes the way people behave, it's not just a young people's thing. Young people certainly spend uh, about 100 interactions a day on their phone. 80% of their time is in apps. I used to work uh, on the board of a company called Monetize in the UK, very involved in the, the early stages of mobile payments. Um, and, and Monetize, when it developed mobile banking, one of the big UK banks told us that it took three years to get one million customers onto PC banking. You know that experience where you've got a fob and you've got to do all sorts of stuff. It's really clunky, it's really frustrating, and you end up saying, why bother? It took them a year, sorry, it took them three years to get a million customers on PC banking. It took them three months to get a million customers on mobile banking. How many of you flew here today? It's all about mobile boarding passes, isn't it? And there are businesses who only live within an app, Uber. That's how you get to Uber, is through the Uber app. So that's the way it's going. Uh, my third message here is the importance of uh, social. So this is about knowing your customer. Social media, as I said earlier, is changing very rapidly. MySpace died very quickly, and it gave way to Facebook. Facebook's still pretty dominant, but it's not the only game in town. And there are players, obviously, like Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and, of course, the incredible WhatsApp. Um, when Facebook bought WhatsApp for $22 billion a few years ago, we all wondered what they were doing. This was a company with 50 engineers. When they bought it, it had 300 million users. A year later, it had 600 million users. And by September last year, 900 million. So adding 300 million users a year. There are 30 billion messages a day sent through WhatsApp. That's more than the entire GSM network. So again, if you're using social media and you're not understanding how WhatsApp and some of these guys uh, operate, uh, you're missing something. So let me just uh, kind of dwell a little bit on ASOS and how, how we use social media. What are we? Um, you know, are we a fashion retailer? Are we a logistics champion, technology? I, th I think we're all of the above. Our business is fundamentally fast fashion to 20-somethings. We've got about 11 million active customers globally. Um, and yet, despite the fact that we think we're quite good at engagement, 
and interaction. 41% of our customers find out about us by word of mouth, by people talking about us. So this is where art meets science, it's where data and analytics meet emotions. We create a core of loyal customers who tell their friends about us. Because we all know, and David hinted at it there, young people don't absorb advertising and it doesn't build emotional engagement, which is what contributes to loyalty. Audiences get value of content that is designed to meet their needs, and this is what builds a relationship with them. It deepens that emotional engagement. So at ASOS, we have a community. Uh, we have stylists that people like to follow who are recommending latest trends. We solicit contributions, uh, as seen on me. So we have our customers buying something, wearing it, sending us a picture, which we post, and other people like to see ordinary people wearing the gear, and that helps them decide to buy it or not. Um, and, and when people contribute, it deepens their engagement. So as seen on me and the stylist followers have our high frequency of return visits and return purchases. So to reach them, we need to provide value in the communication. We need to meet a practical need. It's very often, what shall I wear to this wedding? Or for the guys, are turn-ups in or are they out? In fashion, you'll find that females are edgy. They're prepared to be different. They want to be leading. Men, as all of the men and probably all of the women in this room know, are pack animals. They don't want to be different. They want to know what every other man is wearing and they want to do the same thing. So color of belts, turn-ups, really, really important. So we have to provide that need. What's cool this season? Or we provide an emotional need to belong, to feel valued. And then the content's consumed, it adds value, and people both remember and they feel good about us. And people do things because of how it makes them feel now or how they think it will make them feel in the future. Um, our young customers think fashion is a lifestyle. It's not just a purchase. They're constantly sharing, constantly comparing, constantly liking and loving. And they're validating their fashion choices with their social media peer group. They've been inspired by the latest trends, the latest looks, celebrity fashion, and online blogs. So how can we build on that and leverage that at ASOS? Well, we're also a publisher. We create, we originate about 10 articles a day. We've got a million plus followers on Twitter, about three million on Instagram, two and a half million on Google Plus, and although we'll get three and a half million Facebook likes, I'm not sure that that's a very relevant number anymore. But let me give you a few examples of how we've used it. There's a, there's a reality TV show in the UK called um, Geordie Shore. It, it's a takeoff of a, an MTV show in the US called Jersey Shore about a bunch of girls from New Jersey. Geordies in the UK are girls from the northeast of the UK, a place called Newcastle. Um, and they like to drink and they like to party. So Sophie is one of the, the stars of Geordie Shore. She's also an ASOS ambassador, so she wears gear from us, clothes from us. She gets a bit of a discount. So she was on the program and she tweeted to her 700,000 followers that the yellow dress she was wearing the night before was from ASOS. Well, we've clearly got smart software. Any mention of ASOS in the Twitter sphere, in social media, we pick it up and we, we very quickly direct message uh, Sophie. We say, look, tweet us a picture of you in the dress, um, which, she, which she does. We tweet that to our million followers. She retweets it to her 700,000. There'll be some overlap there. And before we know it, the dress is sold out. That wasn't the purpose of the exercise, but as a byproduct of it. And the dress, as soon as it came in, sold out several times after that. Um, Princess Kate, Kate Middleton in the UK. Kate's just had her second child. Um, Kate's a customer of ASOS. We're not allowed to use that information at the time, but we know when she's bought stuff but we're not allowed to reveal that. But as soon as she appears in the public domain, as soon as the photograph is out there, we can then tag that and start to use it. The nice thing when somebody buys a maternity dress is that you know they're going to wear it quite soon. So Kate bought a maternity dress. It was about $25. Uh, and then she stepped out wearing it at a, at a fashion, uh, at, at a charity event. Um, and then that enabled us, as soon as the picture was out there, to tag it, to get it around the, 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 the channels that we use and our, our week that week was the biggest week in maternity wear. Lots of our customers didn't even know we did maternity. And yet by using that opportunity, we created an incredible awareness and really lifted a part of our store that not many people knew about. And last example in America, Sasha Obama turns up at a college basketball game. She's wearing a unicorn sweatshirt from ASOS. And again, as soon as that's out there, uh, it tweets around and the thing sold out without seconds. So what we do, it's all about creating buzz. It's about fast fashion for 20-somethings. It's about celebrity stories, edits, 
and it's about creating a noise. And that's, let me just show you some examples of this. Taylor Swift, we absolutely love her. Taylor Smith, Taylor Smith, Taylor Swift um, likes ASOS gear. She doesn't get paid for wearing it. She shows up in London, she'll come to our office, she'll do a shoot for us, and our girls love her. Taylor is just like the 20-something girl that's an ASOS customer. Uh, she's got relationship problems, she's got parent problems, she's every girl's BFF. The only difference between her and our customers is about $200 million of net wealth. But they all relate to her quite, quite a lot, and we think she's fabulous. So when, when Taylor comes to the UK, she tells us what she's going to be doing, what she's going to be wearing, and we get her snapped coming out of the BBC studios for an interview, we get her snapped going to an event, and then we can make, make big noise about that. So she's really, really important to us. That was her on her last visit to the UK, wearing some gear that we provided, and that's the output you get it into the, the, the fashion press and the, and the news press. That was Kate wearing the ASOS maternity dress, and again, we get lots of coverage of that. It's not just those two, it's Miley Cyrus, Katy Perry, and then for the guys, George Ezra. So those are the sorts of things that we do, uh, and it's really, really important. The other importance of social media uh, is peer validation, opinion, and endorsement. We know that millennials and digital natives don't trust politicians, they don't trust the press, they don't trust people in TV, they don't trust big corporates, they certainly don't trust Volkswagen. They trust each other. 78% of customers trust peer recommendations, only 14% trust adverts. So, what is ASOS? Um, it's not just a digital business. You know, a lot of what we do is about bits. A lot of what we do is about atoms. I mean, we actually, in the last six months, we have physically shot nine million photographs. We've given an opportunity to 150 new models to support and promote 83,000 products. But digital is our DNA. It's the glue that holds it all together for us. It's where data and emotions come together. So mobile and social will be massive. If your business hasn't figured that out yet, I think you may just be too late. And so finally, before we take some questions, uh, the question I was asked at the start, will Amazon and the rest of e-commerce kill the high street? I don't think so. It's hard to get a handle on what share of retail e-commerce is today. On average, it's probably 15%, one five. It's more in some sectors, less in others. Let's call it 15. The 15 is going to get to 30. I don't know by when, but it's going to get to 30. It's going to double but it's not going to get to 100. So the high street, the big stores, the, de the departmental stores, the shopping malls that you're famous for here, um, they're not going to disappear. But it's going to, the trend is going to continue, and it's like water finding its own level. I think what will happen is that actually the smart stores, the good stores, the stores that know the customers, they are the ones that will kill the rest of the high street. The strong guys will eat the duds. Back to Darwin. Think of the buffalo hares that roamed America in the 1800s. At one point, there was 20 million of them. And then man came and started uh, populating the place. And he chased them, and the slow, fat, dumb ones at the back were the first to get killed. And we actually got after them all. And they became almost extinct. And that's what's happening in retail today. So unless you truly understand your customer and connect with them in the way they want, then you are under threat. So I think if you're a retailer today, you don't need to be better than Amazon or ASOS to survive. You just need to be better than the store next door. So let me finish with one story to illustrate that point. There are two hunters in upstate New York out hunting, and they come into a clearing, and they see this giant shadow come over them, and they look up terrified. It's a bear, and bears are fearsome, fast, and life-threatening. And they look at each other in panic. One opens up his rucksack and starts to put on a pair of Nike trainers, and his friend says to him, what are you doing? You can't outrun the bear. And he said, I don't have to. I just have to outrun you. So who can you run faster than? That's the question for you today. Thank you.